Pahangbante. Ti saranina saha pancha silani yachami. Dutiampi ahangbante. Ti saranina saha pancha silani yachami. Dutiampi ahangbante. Ti saranina saha pancha silani yachami. Namo tasa bhagavato arahato sama sambudhasa. 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 Buddhang saranang gachami. Buddhang saranang gachami. Dhammang saranang gachami. Dhammang saranang gachami. Sanghang saranang gachami. Sanghang saranang gachami. Dutiyampi buddhang saranang gachami. Dutiyampi buddhang saranang gachami. Dutiyampi dhammang saranang gachami. Dutiyampi dhammang saranang gachami. Dutiyampi sanghang saranang gachami. Dutiyampi sanghang saranang gachami. Tatiyampi buddhang saranang gachami. Tatiyampi buddhang saranang gachami. Tatiyampi dhammang saranang gachami. Tatiyampi dhammang saranang gachami. Tatiyampi sanghang saranang gachami. Tatiyampi sanghang saranang gachami. Ti saranagamanang nititang. Amabante. Panati pata veramani sikha padam samadhyami. Panati pata veramani sikha padam samadhyami. Adinna dana veramani sikha padam samadhyami. Adinna dana veramani sikha padam samadhyami. Kami su ni chaha chara veramani sikha padang samadhyami. Kami su ni chaha chara veramani sikha padang samadhyami. Musa vada veramani sikha padang samadhyami. Musa vada veramani Sikha padang samadhyami. Sura miraya manja pamadatthana. Veramani sikha padang samadhyami. Sura miraya manja pamadatthana. Veramani sikha padang samadhyami. Imani pancha sikha padani. Sile na sugating anti. Sile na boga sampada. Sile na nibuting anti. Tasma si lang uso dha ye. Sadu, sadu, sadu. Sadu, sadu, sadu. Sadu, sadu, sadu. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. Hello and welcome everyone. This is the weekly study group with Venerable Yutadamo. We will begin our reading now of the Vasudhi Maga. We will take turns reading going in alphabetical order. Please read one paragraph if it's long. 
and two paragraphs if it's short. If you have any questions about the text, you may ask it after someone has finished reading or hold off until after the hour. We are currently at chapter two, paragraph 20. In paragraph 20, the grades are these. These are three kinds of refuse rag wearers, the strict, the medium, and the mild. Herein, one who takes it only from a charnel ground is strict. One who takes one left by someone thinking, one gone forth will take it, is medium. One who takes one given by being placed at his feet by a bhikkhu is mild. The moment any one of these of his own choice or inclination agrees to accept a robe given by a householder, his ascetic practice is broken. This is the breach in this instance. Is, is there a difference? Um, I mean, if it's placed at his feet and then uh, it says if you accept it given by a householder, I mean, even a householder can place it at, at his feet, no? You're referring to the medium grade? Yes. Oh, mild. Uh, it, mild. Yeah, as compared to the medium, right? One who takes one given by being placed at his feet, oh, by a bhikkhu, is mild. Okay. So it's in, important that it's placed by a bhikkhu, right? And not a, by a householder then. Yeah, that's interesting. I mean, obviously, he's adding that, so I'm not sure where he's getting that from. So I'm not sure if it is improper for a layperson. Because I know above it was talking about how a monk may place it at another monk's feet in order to let them keep the keep the training. But does that mean if a layperson places it at their feet that it's improper? No, I mean, it says that place by the donors at a bhikkhu's feet. Oh, I'm given by that bhikkhu. It doesn't say anything about a donor placing it at a rag robe wearer's feet. 21. The benefits are these. He actually practices in conformity with the dependence because of the words. The going forth by depending on the refuse rag robe. He is established in the first of the noble one's heritage. There is no suffering due to protecting. He exists independent of others. There is no fear of robbers. There is no craving connected with use of robes. It is a requisite suitable for an ascetic. It is a requisite recommended by the Blessed One thus. Valueless, easy to get, and blameless. It inspires confidence. It produces the fruits of fewness of wishes, etc. The right way is cultivated. A good example is set to later generations. 22. While striving for death's, army, death's army's route, the ascetic clad in rag robe clout got from a rubbish heap shines bright as male clad warrior in the fight. This robe the world's great teacher wore, leaving rare kasi cloth and more. Of rags from off a rubbish heap, who would not have a robe to keep. Minding the words he did profess when he went into homelessness, let him to wear such rags delight, as one in seemly garb be dight. Thus, firstly, is the commentary on the undertaking directions, grades, breach, and benefits in the case of the refuse rag wearer's practice. 23. Next, there is the triple robe wearer's practice. This is undertaken with one of the following statements. I refuse a fourth robe, or I undertake the triple robe wearer's practice. When a triple robe wearer has got cloth for a robe, he can put it by for as long as, owing to ill health, he is unable to make it up, or for as long as he does not find a helper, or lacks a needle, etc. 
and there is no fault in his putting it by. But it is not allowed to put it by once it has been dyed. This is called cheating the ascetic practice. These are the directions for it. So for those, uh, and for anyone who's actually thinking of keeping these, uh, the, the way I'm familiar with taking it is to say both of these things. So you'll see there are two parts to, and, and the, the text says, anyatra vachanena, so one can say one or the other. When when one says either one of these, then that's keeping them, or that that's that's undertaking it, sorry. But uh, the standard practice is to say them both. This is what I, I did with that Jantong, and I've seen other monks do it as well. Chatuta ka ji varang patikipami, te ji varikang kang samatiyami, dutiyampi chatuta ka ji varang patikipami, te ji varikang kang samatiyami, tatiyampi chatuta ka ji varang patikipami, te ji varikang kang samatiyami. And they're, they're all 13 of them are very similar. The, the formula is fairly similar. I mean, does this mean that they have uh, three three uh, robes? No, right? I only thought that uh, monks have one set of robes. One set of three robes. Mm -hmm. But normally you can keep other robes at certain times. And you can have a rain's bathing cloth. Or there's a lot of exceptions. But this person doesn't take those exceptions. I also wanted to ask about, like, um, for a refuse, refuse uh, robe wearer that, I mean, they gather these uh, cloths from charnel ground and etc. Like, do they have rules to keep them clean? Like, does it have to be, like, clean as well? Not just, not just like, or they, they look like really poor, poor looking. Uh, well, there are rules, not about, not about cleanliness, I don't think, uh, but more about uh, keeping, the, keeping the cloth, keeping the robes um, safe. There's rules about hanging them up and that sort of thing. Just, just to be careful, you don't want to put them on a piece of uh, wood that has splinters, that sort of thing. So you have to check it for splinters first. My question is: uh, Would you recognize uh, one who is like a rag robe wearer by looking at his um, robe, basically? Well, it depends on which cloth, what type of cloth he is. Mm -hmm. There was, a, I, I knew a monk who tried to make a rag, a rag robe cloth here in Thailand, and the the the, the, the power. There were some senior monks who basically told him he wasn't allowed to wear it. But in modern times, I, I can only imagine what he tried to make it out of, because you can't just find white cloth. White cotton cloth is not easy to find in modern times. And so if you get a piece of polyester cloth, then you can't dye it, right? It has to be cotton or it won't take the dye. And then if it's already dyed, then you've got different colored pieces, which is actually okay as long as you get it in the, as long as you can get it the right range of colors. But in Thailand, it would never fly. I once um, committed, I had a monk sew me a piece, sew me a robe, and uh, we we worked together to dye it, and it was uh, pretty ugly looking, mostly because of the dye. Did you wear it? Yeah, yeah, I wore it, and some senior monks were not very happy about it. They said I looked like a beggar. But I wore it when I went to Los Angeles because it was I got a thick piece of cotton cloth. That was before I knew about any... I don't know if they were making thicker robes back then, but 
I didn't know there was a way in Thailand to get thicker rooms. 24. This too has three grades. Urine, one who is strict should, at the time of dying, first dye either the inner cloth or the upper garment. And having dyed it, he should wear that around the waist and dye the other. Then he can put that on over the shoulder and dye the cloak of patches. But he is not allowed to wear the cloak of patches around the waist. This is the duty when an abode inside a village. But it is allowable for him in the forest to wash and dye two together. However, he should sit in a, in a place near to the robes so that if he sees anyone, he can pull a yellow cloth over himself. But for the medium one, there is a yellow cloth in the dying room for use while dying. And it is allowable for him to wear that as an inner cloth or to put it on. Uh, as an upper garment in order to do the work of dying. For the mild one, it is allowable to wear or put on the robes of bhikkhus who are in communion, that is, not suspended, etc., in order to do the work of dying. A bedspread that remains where it is is also allowable for him, but he must not take it about him. And it is allowed for him to use from time to time the robes of bhikkhus who are in communion. It is allowed to one who wears the triple robe as an aesthetic practice to have a yellow shoulder cloth too as a fourth. But it must only be a span wide and three hands long. The moment any one of these three agrees to accept a fourth robe, his aesthetic practice is broken. This is the breach in this instance. I was looking for something where it mentioned a bedspread. I guess that means there must be something in the Vinaya about bedspreads. Trying to think now. Blankets. I don't know that I ever saw blankets. It may be that we're not allowed blankets and the Sangati is supposed to be our blanket. But a bedspread might be not a blanket, but rather a cloth to keep the bed clean when you lie on it, because otherwise, as we learned about earlier, this disgusting body will make the bed dirty. And this is, I think, the only mention, I'm not sure if there's any other mention, but this is a mention of the angsa, which is this shoulder cloth. None of you are probably very interested in this, but we have a, we're allowed to wear a shoulder cloth just over our shoulder. Three hands long, that's quite small actually. The benefits are these. The bhikkhu who is a triple robe wearer is content with the robe as a protection for the body. Hence he, he goes taking it with him as a bird does its wings. Um, see uh, MI 180 and such special qualities as having few undertakings, avoidance of storage of cloth, a frugal existence, the abandoning of greed for many robes, living in effacement by observing moderation, even in what is permitted, production of the fruits, a fewness of wishes, etc., are perfected. 26. No risk of hoarding haunts the man of wit, who wants no extra cloth for requisite. Using the triple rope where he goes, the pleasant relish of content he knows. So would the adept wander undeterred with naught else but his robes as flies the bird with its own wings, then let him too rejoice that frugalness and garments be his choice. This is the commentary on the undertaking, directions, grades, breach, and benefits in the case of the triple rope wearer's practice. 27. The alms food eater's practice is undertaken with one of the following statements. I refuse a supplementary food supply, or 
I undertake the alms food eater's practice. Now, this alms food eater should not accept the following 14 kinds of meal. A meal offered to the order, a meal offered to specified bhikkhus, an invitation, a meal given by a ticket, one each half moon day, one each uposata day, one each first of the half moon, a meal given for visitors, a meal for travelers, a meal for the sick, a meal for sick nurses, a meal supplied to a particular residence, a meal given in a principal house, a meal given in turn. If, instead of saying, take a meal given to the order, meals are given saying, the order is taking alms in our house, you may take alms too, it is allowable to consent. Tickets from the order that are not for actual food and also a meal cooked in a monastery are allowable as well. These are the di directions for it. I don't understand that last one, a meal cooked in a monastery. Why would that be allowed? That's very strange. I don't understand something there. Just to recap, I, I'm not, I, wanted to, I thought it might not be clear to everyone that these dutangas, maybe it is clear, but for anyone who is, who is not clear, these dutangas are, are optional practices that monks and some of them lay people undertake from time to time to sort of uh, boost their practice or to uh, jumpstart their practice when they're having, uh, when they're first starting out, especially, or when they're deep into their practice and they want something to challenge them themselves further and they're giving the reasons for keeping them but i mean most monks wouldn't keep these all the time and so all these allowances all these things that he, he says he doesn't do are are allowed for monks and are okay for lay people many of these things as well it's just some the, the idea is that some people keep these and as he's, he mentioned one should try to keep all of them that they can when one when one begins to under because remember the word this whole thing is about a hypothetical monk who's on his way to learn meditation. So what should they do first? And he says, well, they should, if they're on their way to learn meditation, they should undertake to, to keep as many of the Dutangas as they can, and even though they're optional. I think there's somewhere later in this text, but in the Vinay as well, one isn't allowed to pressure someone into keeping these. To, to tell someone you should keep them or something like that. There's there's a certain amount of pressure that's not allowed. They're, they're to be taken. They're to be undertaken voluntarily by people who are looking for extra. And when they're undertaken, like in, in the example of um, a, a bhikkhu who's just starting out on his way learning to meditate, how long would they typically be undertaken for? Would it be a period of like three months, a year, or um, something else? Well, I think the most common answer would be for the duration of the time they're they're dedicating themselves to practice. So we're 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 talking about a good hypothetical would be a monk who has other engagements with teaching or with uh, working in the monastery. There's going to be a list of things that he has to give up as well, and then they give all those things up and undertake to do intensive practice. So, I mean, there's many here that someone who is on their way to do an intensive practice in meditation might consider to take up during their mm -hmm. course if they're really keen and, and likely if they've done courses before and want to sort of go a step further in their practice, challenge themselves. Now, you yeah. sometimes see meditators even here who will eat only one meal a day. It's a little mm -hmm. bit awkward because the first meal is too small and too early and the second mm -hmm. meal is uh, is too late. Yeah, so 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 it, it, a lot of times may even just be for that like short period of like three to four weeks while they're doing an uh, intensive retreat. I uh, wanted to ask about the tickets that uh, are mentioned here. So, so these tickets are mentioned in the like, 
they are allowed, basically? Mm, yeah. Oh. I mean, it's not maybe quite a ticket. It's a piece of paper on which is written a promise to give food to uh, some some variation of monks, or like someone might say, "Bring th send three monks to my house. I will receive. I will give food for three monks." And then someone, one of the monks, is responsible for picking three monks to go and and receive the food. That sort of thing. I mean, there were some some systems like that set up. Yeah, and it sounds like uh, what um, we were doing, right, with the food cart. Yeah, that was the idea behind the mm. the uh, give food gift cards. Exactly, and uh, even what I think Claudio was doing, right, with the arrangement with the right. But yeah, it would be more, um, more. I think about giving a piece of paper to a monk saying this is good for one meal at my house or something like that. I'm not sure if it's quite like an IOU. It's more like a. I think it was more like a today. Maybe they maybe they wrote papers just so that um, it was clear how many they would they would write papers and say maybe just a paper with their address and say one monk or three monks give it over to the monastery. And then the monastery would find monks and to bring those papers, and they would take those papers and like a ticket. There's a thing that a tradition that's probably well, that certainly stems from this in Thailand, where there's one day of the year, I think it's the last full moon during the rains, where they have salaka salaka bata. I mean, is is the word being used here? Salaka is ticket, and bata is meal. So they have this thing that they call ngan salaka pat which means the ceremony of the ticket meal. So they, all the lay people come and set up a station of a, some sort of gift, usually food, usually a bit of money, and some maybe some other stuff. Oh, it's been so long. It, I, was, I think I was like one year a monk when they were still doing this. Or The only time I've done it is so, so long ago. And then... Each of the lay people signs a ticket or something, or a, um, a number, piece of paper with a number on it. No, they don't sign. They don't have to sign it. So they get a number, and so if you're number twenty six, then I give you twenty six, and I put a twenty six in a in a bag or in a hat or something. And then all the monks in the monastery would get to reach into the hat and pull one out. And there were reasons why some people got two. What was the reason? Some monks actually got more than one. I think it was, I um, can't remember what it was. Was it rank or something? Seniority? I can't remember. But some monks actually got more than one ticket. And then uh, you'd go and find the person who had your, your number. And you'd give them the number and then you give them a blessing and they offer you all, they offer you all the stuff and then you give them a blessing. Quite an interesting ceremony. Got a little bit out of hand. Um, there were village people waiting to waiting to beg, and uh, even one monk was angry because they they were just stealing his stuff. Like he gave a blessing, and I think he hadn't even finished giving the blessing. They already started taking some of his stuff. People who were vultures waiting at the monastery for whatever's left over. Uh, I remember you saying Ajahn Tong was practicing this alms food eaters practice, mm -hmm. right? Um, during during the rains. Yeah. I was wondering if he went out. No, he didn't go out mostly. I did this with him, and we did the alms round inside the monastery. Mm. And they just ate whatever whatever we got in the alms bowl. Uh, I, did it, I did it like that with him because of time constraints, because I had to sit with him for reporting. And then, yeah, there was one year where I, I really did that. Later on, the alms round was moved to another place. 
once the monastery. But yeah, it was inside the monastery. We would have, I did go outside of the monastery with him once. If I remember, that was because he had he was clear that I was going on alms round outside every day, and he kind of said, "Hey, I want to do that as well." I think I can't remember how it came about, but at one one time we went out and we just went out to the front of the monastery and 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 back in, which is actually quite a ways because of how big the monastery is. Uh, but I did walk with on alms with him with three or four other monks outside once. So, Bhante, what do you mean inside? And so people would bring uh, food to the monastery. To the I mean, yes. Inside? All right. Yeah, there's a lot of a lot of uh, nuns living in the monastery. Some, well, med many meditators would come and, and give food as a part of their practice. They would go out and buy in the market and give food during their courses. Twenty-eight. These two has three grades. Herein, one who is strict takes arms brought both from before and from behind, and he gives the ball to those who take it while he stands outside a door. He also takes arms brought to the refectory and given there, but he does not take arms by sitting and waiting for it to be brought later that day. The medium one takes it as well by sitting and waiting for it to be brought later that day, but he does not consent to its being brought the next day. The mild one consents to alms being brought on the next day and on the day after. Both these last miss the joy of an independent life. There is perhaps a preaching on the noble one's heritage in some village. The strict one says to the others, let us go, friends, and listen to the Dhamma. One of them says, I have been made to sit and wait by a man, venerable sir. And the other, I have consented to receive alms tomorrow, venerable sir. So they are both losers. The other wanders for alms in the morning and then he goes and savors the taste of the Dhamma. The moment any one of these three agrees to the extra gain consisting of a meal given to the order, etc., his ascetic practice is broken. This is the breach in this instance. But um, so Buddha Gosa, for some of them, this is what, an example of where he he makes an opinion on, or I don't I don't think it's his opinion, but he expresses the the consensus opinion that uh, only one of the grades or only certain grades are are appropriate. So there are three grades, but in this case, if you want to keep it, you really should keep the first grade, the strict grade. Twenty nine. The benefits are these. He actually practices in conformity with the dependence because of the words, the going forth by depending on the eating of lumps of alms food. He's established in the second of the noble ones' as heritages. His existence is independent of others. It is a requisite recommended by the Blessed One thus, valueless, easy to get, blameless. Idleness is eliminated. Livelihood is purified. The practice of the minor training rule of the Padimokha is fulfilled. He is not maintained by another. He helps others. Pride is abandoned. Craving for tastes is checked. The training precepts about eating as a group, substituting one meal invitation for another, and good behavior are not contravened. His life conforms to the principles of fewness of wishes. He cultivates the right way. He has compassion for later generations. Well, compassion here means uh, he he sets a good example for future generation out of compassion for them. That's what it means. By being strict, 
he sets a good example for future generations to not be lazy. Uh, the monk, content with alms for food, as independent livelihood, and greed in him no footing finds. He is as free as the four winds. He never need be indolent. His livelihood is innocent. So let a wise man not disdain alms gathering for his domain. Since it is said, if a bhikkhu can support himself on alms and live without another another's maintenance, and pay no heed as well to gain and fame, the very gods indeed might envy him. This is the commentary on the undertaking, directions, grades, breach, and benefits in the case of the alms food eater's practice. 31. The house-to-house -house seeker's practice is undertaken with one of the following statements. I refuse a greedy alms round or I undertake the house-to-house -house seeker's practice. Now, the house-to-house -house seeker should stop at the village gate and make sure that there is no danger. If there is danger in any street or village, it is allowable to leave it out and wander for arms as well. When there is a house door or a street or a village where he regularly gets Nothing at all, he can go past it at not counting it as a village. But wherever he gets anything at all, it is not allowed subsequently to go past there and leave it out. This bhikkhu should enter the village early so that he will be able to leave out any inconvenient place and go elsewhere. But if, he, if people who are giving a gift of a meal in a monastery or who are coming along the road take his bow, bowl and give arms food, it is allowable. And as this bhikkhu is going along the road, he should, when it is the time, wander, off, wander for arms in any village he comes to and not pass it by. If he gets nothing there, or only a little, he should wander for arms in the next village in order. These are the directions for it. 32. This too has three grades. Herein, one who is strict does not take arms brought from before or brought from behind or brought to the refectory and given there. He hands over his bowl at a door. However, for in this ascetic practice, there is none equal to the elder Mahakasapa, yet, yet an instance in which even he handed over his bowl is mentioned. See Udana 29. The medium one takes what is brought from before and from behind and what is brought to the refectory and he hands over his bowl at a door, but he does not sit waiting for arms. Thus he conforms to the rule of the strict, arm, strict arms food eater. The mild one sits waiting for arms to be brought that day. The ascetic practice of these three is broken as soon as the greedy arms round starts by going only to the house, houses where good arms food is given. This is the bridge in this instance. So the idea is that you would go until you got enough food. But once your bowl is fu full, then you stop perceiving. Or once you have enough food to eat, you stop and go back. And that's challenging because if you go in order, you might not get the food that you want. But if, on the other hand, you start at the houses where you know you'll get better food, and you can assure yourself of getting the best food. So that's why that's the greedy alms run. If you go in order of houses, then you might not get to the good houses. 
Or it, it means you just you just can't be picky and choosy. But do, but what happens when there are uh, a number of monks? Do they go together or do they? Uh, how is that done? Well, no, they often go on different. They go to different parts of the village. Uh, sometimes they cross paths, and so they both receive food from the same place, but at different times. Sometimes they do go together. Like right now, I'm going with Chris, with Siri Chanda, who is absent. I don't know why he's not here tonight. I'm not absent, Monty. Oh, he's here. Right. I think I'm looking for you up in the seas or something. <laughs> ah, you're here. Good. 33. The benefits are these. He is always a stranger among families and is like the moon. He abandons avarice about families. He is compassionate and partially. He avoids the dangers in being supported by a family. He does not delight in invitations. He does not hope for meals to be brought. His life conforms to the principles of fewness of wishes and so on. 34. The monk who at each house has begging plies is moonlike, ever new to families, nor does he grudge to help all equally, free from the risks of house dependency. Who would the self indulgent round forsake and roam the world at will, while to make? His downcast eyes range a yoke length before. Then let him wisely seek from door to door. This is the commentary on the undertaking, directions, grades, breach, and benefits in the case of the house to house seeker's practice. Five, the one sessioner's practice is undertaken with one of the following statements I refuse eating in several sessions, or I undertake the one sessioner's practice. When the one sessioner sits down in the sitting hall, instead of sitting on an elder's seat, he should notice which seat is likely to fall to him and sit down on that. If his teacher or a preceptor arrives while the meal is still unfinished, it is allowable for him to get up and do the duties. But the elder, the pitika, Ula Abaya said he should either keep his seat and finish his meal, or if he gets up, he should leave the rest of his meal in order not to break the ascetic practice. And this is one whose meal is still unfinished. Therefore, let him do the duties. But in that case, let him not eat the rest of the meal. These are the directions. So the commentary here is about how a monk has obviously their preceptor, the one who was responsible for their ordination. And then at certain times when they're not with their preceptor, they can take a different, like if they go to another monastery, normally they have to be with their preceptor for five years, but so they can also go to another monastery and learn from a different teacher. And so then they take that person as their teacher, their, their formal teacher. And if that, if either the preceptor or that teacher enters into the room, they have to stand up and not only stand up, but do other duties as well. And so the question is, well, what, what if they're in the middle of eating and then the teacher comes in? And so this is the debate. This one monk seems pretty strict saying, yeah, you should stand up, but he, he also has to stop eating if he's keeping this, if he's, if he's dedicated to keeping this rule where He'll only eat at one sitting. Well, you you could just think about it, right? That to wait for your preceptor and then after that uh, start your meal, because otherwise you you I mean there is a chance that they will come and I mean you can think ahead. That's true. Uh, Thirty six. This too has three grades. Herein, one who is strict may not take anything more than the food that he has laid his hand on, whether it is little or much. And if people bring him ghee, etc., thinking, the elder has eaten nothing, 
while these are allowable for the purpose of medicine, they are not so for the purpose of food. The medium one may take more as long as the meal in the bowl is not exhausted, for he is called one who stops when the food is finished. The mild one may eat as long as he does not get up from his seat. He is either one who stops with the water, because he eats until he takes water for washing the bowl, or one who stops with the session, because he eats until he gets up. The ascetic practice of these three is broken at the moment when food has been eaten at more than one session. This is the breach in this instance. 37. The benefits are these. He has little affliction and little sickness. He has lightness, strength, and a happy life. There's no contravening rules about food that is not what is left over from a meal. Craving for tastes is eliminated. His life conforms to the principles of fewness, of wishes, and so on. 38. No illness due to eating show he feel, who gladly in one session takes his meal. No longing to indulge his sense of taste tempts him to leave his work to go to waste. His own true happiness a monk may find in eating in one session, pure in mind. Purity and effacement wait on this, for it gives reason to abide in bliss. This is the commentary on the undertaking, directions, grades, breach, and benefits in the case of the one sessioner's practice. So I, I just were wanting to ask whether do they mean when they say he has lightness, strength, and a happy life, would it maybe refer to mental strength because it's possible to be physically weak if you're not eating? Yeah, mental strength likely uh, but overeating can also create weakness physical weakness eating too many times in the day so there might be an idea that if you eat once a day your body is benefits from it called uh, intermittent fasting it's a new trend or something like that yeah i never thought of it that way We've now passed the hour, so we will stop our reading there. Now is the time to ask any questions related to the text, if you have any. Maybe uh, anyone has any questions related to their meditation practice or Buddhism, they can feel free to ask it now as well. Bante, I just checked a list of abbreviations for text use. It's on page 23 in the PDF and Angutar Nikaya, the A. Yeah, it is in Guttar Nikaya, but the two isn't, I think it isn't Book of Twos. I may be wrong. Oh, okay. But I think it's the second volume in the PED. I may actually be wrong. I'm not, but I think so because look at like in Majima Nikaya. But I actually, I'm not sure. I shouldn't have said it. I don't really know. But I wouldn't be sure it's the Book of Twos as well. Well, the books are usually. Um noted as uh, Roman numbers? Yeah, it's books, but it's uh, volumes of the P P Polytech Society, I think. Yeah, I, I, I'm almost certain Bante is correct because I just had to look something up in, uh, in Guru Nakaya, and the, the reference given was with the, um, the, the, the PTS numbering, and it was c completely different from uh, what it would correspond to anywhere else. But it, if you go to um, Sutta Central and look up, you know, any of the um, the suttas there, it'll have both, you know, like the common numbering, and then most of the time it'll also have the PTS numbering. So you, usually you can figure out what one it's supposed to be from that. It sounds confusing then. Well, you have to understand this was translated back when that's all they had. Actually, that that's not even really true. I I don't know because they they could have referred to, but maybe the Sinhalese wasn't easily available. This is this is quite old. This translation, but what they were using was the Polytech Society. It was at the time the Polytech Society was sort of the the standard 
for international monks and they were expecting it to be the standard. It's kind of not anymore, I don't think, but it was for quite some time. And it didn't help that he was probably going by English translations and English translators who were all a part of the Polytech Society and they would always refer to their internal numbering system, which is pretty awful to be honest. And they would often refer to like page numbers. So like this might even be referring to page numbers, like the, 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 the number after the Roman numeral. Mm-hmm. But that's how they would do it. Within the Polytech Society, they would like M1180. What is the 180? It's got to be the page number. It's not the uh, sutta number, right? M1180 is Majimilikaya 1. So that's probably correct. That's probably the first, the the Pattama Panasa, the first 50. But 180 is probably the page number in the Polytech Society version. And it's a bit of a nightmare because nobody has that anymore. And so in order to find out what that refers to, it's it's not easy. There was some, you know, there's there's been discussions over the years by people trying to sort of standardize it. And I imagine the people in Sutta Central have created their own standard. But there's also the, the VRI, the Vipassana Research Institute, who had their own numbering system, I think. And that's the poly that we use for the digital poly reader. So Buddha knew all these verses that uh, appear in this text. I, I was just going to say, I was trying to find the, um, uh, w- what part of the Nguru or Nakaya that would be. And the, uh, the number enlisted for the PTS society, it's re- really does not make a whole lot of sense, but the, the closest that I can find is that it would be, um, somewhere in the Chatu Kanipata in the um the Uruvela Vaga and the the numbering isn't really going in order but there's s- similar numbering around there so um, if someone wants to spend the time to figure out where that is that, that might be a good head start <laughs> thank you for looking You're welcome. All right. Well, that's all for me this week. Have a good week, everyone. Thank you all for coming. I appreciate the attendance. Please uh, be patient with this. Some of these are going to be appropriate for lay people, but most of them are pretty specific for monks. We haven't gotten to the part where it's actually about meditation practice so much yet, but we'll get there. Sad. Have a good week. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. Thank you, Bhante. Thank you all.